Plant biology at Rutgers really testifies to an extensive list of accomplishments <laughs> that are far beyond my pea brain to put together. But I want to tell you about Jim has the career that many times in college, this is what I dreamed about being. He has a, uh, an excellent knowledge of botany, favorite plant genus, awesomum. <laughs> awesomum basilicum, you might recognize from your uh, tomato, basil, mozzarella sandwich. Um, but, you know, beyond botany, went into, before even grad school, was working in uh, the uh, Israeli Ministry of Plant Biology and was studying natural plant products, um, volatile compounds, essential oils, and really developed a passion for natural plant products, medicinals, um, and has been able to connect that uh, all the way through to uh, what I see as a real profound human good, which is taking uh, and finding unique compounds, finding plants that produce these compounds, developing an entire reading program to understand how to produce uh, more of these compounds, and then uh, really has put it to work in, a, uh, in an innovative uh, development program that's funded by uh, USAID, I want to say, uh, at the level of around $100 million by now, this work that uh, finds the opportunity that's made possible in producing natural plant products and connects it with uh, uh, especially cash poor people, especially in Africa, uh, to produce um, these valuable uh, plant products, sell them for premium prices in the markets and really create an avenue out of poverty. Um, and so it's really, uh, for me, humbling to see what he's been able to achieve in his career, which is obviously not yet finished. So uh, I hope you will uh, share your attention with Jim as he talks about the work that he's been doing uh, many years now in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, related to natural plant products. Best thing I uh, liked about the introduction is when you said, I'm not yet retired. So this <laughs> I think I could have presented this years ago if I knew what I was doing. So I present some models that make it look like we know what we're doing. But by the time we present it, we make it in a succinct manner so that it becomes real. I'll talk about using horticulture as a vehicle for income generation and, and, and nutritional improvement in Sub Saharan Africa. And I'll try to tie it in to the people's concerns about food security poverty of mediation and the governance of, of democracy. Our focus is really on rural poor and urban poor in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it happened really by mistake. It's estimated that 925 million of the world's population are undernourished. Sometimes it's called undernourished, sometimes it's called malnourished. 26% of those come from Sub-Saharan Africa, with the number of poor is projected to increase by 400 million in 2015. So regardless of why one might be interested in poverty, the population, the way the world changes and the closeness to the world, considering all the things that go on politically, we all have a stake in what goes on and in making things go to the shape that we want to do. In fact, a recent Lancet series on malnutrition reported that 165 million children under the age of five in the developing world was funded because of chronic malnutrition. And this is chronic malnutrition in times where billions of dollars have gone into the US and European and Asian donor funded in order to provide more food. But yet even as food increases, population increases, and those that are even getting food, malnutrition exists to a greater extent right now. Additional 146 million children are underweight, an important risk factor for mortality as the risk of dying from malnutrition increases with declining weight. With malnutrition comes very, at least an indirect link to less than robust responses to, say, to retrovirals for those suffering from AIDS and other from infectious and non-infectious diseases, or when they're now nourished. The direct link between nutrition and the efficacy of a particular drug treatment is a little bit beyond 
the reach and acceptance by all the different communities. So clearly there's an association that the more undernourished and malnourished you are, the higher likelihood that the drug treatment that's being given is not going to be as effective. Thus, it's important to, to address and design food system approaches to improving dietary quality as a means to reduce the prevalence of other nutrition. And not just focus on total energy, calories from micronutrients, which most people do, and most breeders do, and most agricultural programs do, and most funders support, from Gates to USAID to GTZ, but also to focus on the micronutrient under nutritional aspects of it. And recognize this major challenge, USAID developed this multi-sectoral nutrition strategy, as they do every five or 10 years, to decrease malnutrition and improve nutrition, as well as increase. So if we look at, um, and as I talk, I'm not gonna be reading through my slides, so I hope that's okay. But the point is there's a lot of poor people and the poor and the undernourished seem to be increasing. The projected population growth around the world is shown up here. I, I highlight in red the Sub-Saharan Africa where my focus is. And I'll show you why I went there by accident. And now it's in January when I go back, it'll be my 102nd trip back to Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, that's a lot of frequent fly miles over there. And I will show you why it's worked out there. But the percent of increase is 134% of projected population growth. Each of those people are going to require food and higher expectations all over the world. And when we look at the, the mission of trying to do peace and food and economic stability with each countries, a lot of it's tied to education, a lot of it's tied to poverty, and a lot of it's tied to available accessible food at affordable prices. Just one example of opinion of working there. Just look at dietary challenges relative to micronutrients. Food security exists really when an adequate and stable supply of food is available at all times. If you open up your closet, even though you might complain that you don't have enough to eat one night, you can still likely be food secure for X numbers of days or longer. But people overseas in Sub-Saharan Africa who are in the very world poor all over the, these developing worlds. People don't have that access. They don't have the storage. They don't have the affordability. And so they, there's, there's limited stable food supply. So food security exists when people have the ability to obtain the physical and economic access to appropriate, sufficient, safe, and nutritious foods to meet their dietary needs, and ability to consume and benefit from the food feed foods, leading to an active and healthy life, however one defines it. So a diet resulting in good health and nutrition must be diverse, must be safe, commonly consumed, and fruits and vegetables are really the one area in agriculture that's the often neglected and often child, if I could say. Again, I, I don't say that just because I study and work in horticulture, but when we compare the amount of research, the amount of dollars, the amount of intention, the amount of private sector capital that goes into horticulture, fresh fruits and vegetables, as some of you enjoy now, versus the commodity crops that give us the grains, that give us the flour, the bread, or the cassava, or the peanuts, and or the maize. And I was a professor at Purdue University for 17 years before this, by the way, and there's, there's 18 million acres of corn and soybeans, okay? So maybe 60,000 acres of vegetables, fresh vegetables. The economic and the value of agronomics is just so high that the industry and the focus is on that because it's the ability to get cheap food to people to satiate their, their hunger, create their diets, and give them the energy and the calories, but it doesn't give them the highly nutritious foods on a daily basis that is often needed. And thus, programs of developing orange plus sweet, sweet potatoes, orange maize, are done on purpose in order to improve the pro A or the carotenoid value within that one food stuff that they may be eating, and they may be eating two or three times a day, and the only thing that they may be eating as well. So the approaches that people have used to address food security, and I'll talk about this from a, a, from a larger macro area, because that's what London Nestle has asked me to do, and then I'll kind of dive in and talk to you about some practical ways in which we develop models that appear within our limited vantage point to have shown some success, and talk about the problems as well. But I find that when I work within just the theoretical constructs that people have informed me about, and I go into in-country work, there's a big gap between the theory and the reality. So I'd like to maybe do something different today and talk about kind of the reality of what's going on as well. In the past, population control was a, was a major approach to food security. China's 
policy to have took one child and her family, though that's been recently changed. It was a major relief to the world's emerging population. Despite people's consternation and concern about whether that's right or wrong, the issue is that there was a population control issue, a population explosion issue, a country that couldn't provide the food and security for the population itself. Public policies toward agriculture, food procurement, these are things that you hear, I guess, in the step seminar series a lot from other people. Food relief and delivery for humanitarian purposes is always, has always been both a humanitarian issue, an emergency issue, and, and a current issue for food. Donor, it's always been donor-oriented. Okay? It's not necessarily an participatory approach of what happens in the long term. It's short term, short term stability due to emergency response. It focuses on strengthening the value chain for the major food commodities. Now, we have a lot of foods out there. But I would guess that most of you are consuming really narrow to three to five major foodstuffs in terms of the total amounts of carbohydrates you're getting each, each year. And around the world, we're limited really to five major ones. You have wheat, you have barley, you have rice. Africa, you might have teff. If you have the major grain crops, it's amongst the wide diversity of, of choices we have, and, it's, and there's major reasons for it. They focus on the breeding and the crop improvement for the major food commodities. Okay. They focus on education, sanitation, health, and clean water, they focus on environmental conservation, and now they focus on what we call climate smart agriculture or environmental resiliency. These are the, the temporal and long term changes due to climate change that have impacted in a very severe way the local macro and micro environments. And they focus on technology and business development on the public private sector partnerships now, only now. But it's been all along a very production oriented paradigm. Okay. So let me take you on a trip to sub Saharan Africa. Okay. There's a role, a challenge, and a true opportunity where horticulture in sub Saharan Africa could do the same. In southern United States, by the way, in New Jersey, we have 20% of our population in poverty, like in the US, and, 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 particularly in the southern states in the world, where horticulture and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables is way below standards and recommendations. Africa, most people, or many, many of my students in Rutgers, I'll do Rutgers, not Princeton, because you guys have a better reputation, so you should know the map better. But most people don't realize that Africa is a continent, not a state. And they ask me where I'm going in Africa, and did I see one of their cousins? So the 50 countries, 800 languages, 3,000 dialects, and a variable treasure of genetic resources, including medicinal and aromatic plants. My first trip was through the National Cancer Institute that was a, had a master research license with the National Cancer Institute. And we were going after a dimeric alkaloid called the Shellon B, which was found in the interstitial plate of Scorpensis, in an area in the northern part of Cameroon that was at that point unmapped and inhibited the, the replication of the disease virus. Okay, there's a veritable treasure of these different medicinal and other plants. So why horticulture? Why are we talking about horticulture rather than giving you another seminar? about corn, about soybeans, about Irish potatoes, and other rich people potatoes that are good for you. It's because horticulture provides really high value crops. And all the work that I've been doing all over the world, and I've been in over 40 countries, farmers are always farming. Most farmers don't view agriculture as a livelihood. They just see it as no choice. This is why the children and the children's children leave the rural areas to go to the urban areas where there's no real jobs in many of the countries because there's not that kind of agribusiness opportunities in the rural areas. That itself creates a whole other topic to discuss, lecture-wise. But in the end, what happens is everybody grows the same type of rice. I'll use the example of Madagascar. I'm exaggerating to some extent. I'm happy, by the way, I'm happy to challenge me on anything. Okay. They grow the same type of maize, the same type of, of rice. They harvest it all at the same time. They have very little with any storage access. They sell it to you. You're the only one who has a shed. Okay, you buy it. You buy a boat, okay? And then they all run out of rice at the same time of the year, and they go back and buy it from you at a higher price. What do they do that? They take, chop down some more trees, not open all the areas. They encourage more people to farm. The yields are really low because they don't have any disposable discretionary income that they save for agricultural inputs. And so yields are very low. They keep farming. They, they, so they're keeping busy, but they're not necessarily turning it into an agribusiness. And that's an example that, in a generic way, describes most of commodity-based agriculture in developing worlds, regardless of what the commodity might be. And it means that the income that they generate from selling to, to the individual and pointing at you, because you're just in the front of the eating of the flour for, for these commodity crops, okay, they get once a year, maybe twice a year if they're lucky. And how many people, how many of you are able to save the graduate stipends? More than, a, you know, if you get paid once a month, you're going to really have money from, from, from May or Imagine what a farmer's like when they 
Don't go to banks really because there's very little transaction. They have money once or twice a year, twice a year that comes in, and then they, they barter, they trade, and they try to live. They survive. And one of the reasons why they don't engage in some of these opportunities is because they're always in a survival mood. Mode. So I'm working in Madagascar, and the wild weeds are our vegetables and our fruit trees, and they only eat, well, they only want to eat rice. Okay, and yet they complain that they're, they're hungry. Okay, they complain they don't make any money because we're all selling the same rice, buying it back, and it just is a continual cycle. So we pour more money in, and now we give them really good rice, right? With some extra vitamins in it, but now the rice has to come with a certain pesticide, a certain nitrogen source which they can't afford. So they get the germplasm, but they don't do the inputs, they don't get the yields, and it's just more of a cycle. So why horticulture again? Because horticulture can be done at a family level, at a community level, by hundreds of thousands and millions of people. It creates high value crops to eat, to consume, or income generation. One might talk about post-harvest losses and post-harvest this and transportation and lack of roads, but the truth is when we work with people growing mushrooms, when we work with people growing vegetables, they sell everything before they leave the community. They, don't even, they can't even get the product to many of the supermarkets and markets because there's a big demand for it. And so it means that you could use it for trading, you could use it for cash more than once or twice a year. This is a major issue for people around the world. Okay, income generation and crop diversification. Okay? In the year of a drought, in the year of a barely bad environment issue, where maize yields go down, groundnuts or peanuts are called. Corn and maize is the same plant, groundnuts and peanuts are the same plant or wheat or barley, where those yields are low because of drought, because of the monsoon, because of high winds and rains, whatever environmental issues, whatever biotic or abiotic stress occurs, they may lose their major commodity because they're not using the high germplasm, the best germplasm that's insect diseases. They save their own seed in general, and, they, and they're at the mercy of the environment. That is, they are not really farming, but they're tending the soil. So home gardening, food security, is very possible for horticulture. They do it on a very small scale. There's tremendous nutritional benefits of diet diversification, of which those populations in that area don't know about. And yet women are heavily engaged in horticultural crop production and marketing, and at least in sub-Saharan Africa, there might be other scholars in other parts of the world here, women are the real drivers of economic development and enterprise development in sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to agricultural related businesses. You give it to us guys, it's like we don't keep track of the money. We don't always use it for clothing. We don't always use it for children's school fees. We don't always use it to buy food. Okay, sometimes you can make more money through an agricultural enterprise. It's a different issue that you use that disposable income to buy healthy food. Right? So <coughs> you buy something else. You go to a restaurant. You buy something else. Okay, but the women use the income for the benefit of children rather than the men. The selected challenges facing rural enterprise development is that this is a really formal sector. It's considered risky. Why should I invest in horticulture when I have to buy land, sell the land? Or I can buy, sell, and buy trees. Or I can just do what the government is giving it to me, which is grow more corn at a subsidized price, or more rice at a subsidized price. There's a very weak infrastructure for horticulture, and because it's knowledge intense, it's science intensive, and it's not easy, it doesn't come easy. It's very different than if you want to go grow tomatoes in your backyard here in Princeton and trying to grow these things in other areas, particularly when there are major and often significant diseases such as nematodes or different fungal pathogens or bacterial pathogens in those areas. There's a history of production orientation. So everybody wants, when they know that they can make money in tomatoes, you all will grow the same beef steak. I don't know if you like the Ramapo, the new breakfast tomato, the beef steak tomato. So there's going to be a new breakfast 255th, it's going to be called, which is a boring name, but we're celebrating our 250th anniversary. This year, breakfast, all the plants, the new releases are going to be called 250 tomato. Okay? I breed herbs and spices, not the vegetables. And so Adam was talking about how I, I breed oregano and basil, and uh, actually catnip. Anybody has cats? There was super catnip for you. Okay, but to get back to this, it's a, it's a production orientation. So everybody grows the same variety, okay? And they just grow it when they want to grow it. So they don't schedule it to when you, as consumers, want to buy it. They all plant it once, they harvest it once, and then they that the tomatoes again. They don't have this kind of paradigm of making it market-based and going back to what the market needs what the production wants. Okay, simple, but something that's limited. There's that logic gap, the cultural gap, that entrepreneurial gap in doing that. And then there's importation restrictions, quarantine issues, and lack of high quality seed systems, and very few seed companies. So horticulture has a real issue because transaction costs and ag input supplies are extremely costly 
because often those dealers only exist in the capital and there's only a few choices. So whereas in the United States, you have a lot of different choices, so the inputs costs are relatively very low. In another country, the other country, they're very high. So here you want them to put more fur bars on, you want them to use good seeds, but they don't have the option to get it, and then it's a fortune. Okay, then you turn to other systems of agriculture, like organic systems of agriculture, which can work beautifully with rural communities if done correctly. And that's what we do. So this cultural norms and timeliness is a big issue. Again, um, there's a need to honor contracts. There's not, a, there's not a history there of honoring a contract. So if I'm growing something for you, and somebody else comes in the day before, even the same day, and offers a couple of cents more per kilogram of product, you forget the original contract you have and just sell it to what's going on. Now, by the way, this is a fresh produce industry problem that exists in the United States, too. Okay, if you go down to anybody in southern New Jersey, anybody from southern New Jersey here? Anyway, if you go down to southern New Jersey where there's actually real agriculture, yeah, and you have a big truck, and you go to a farm, and you say, fill it up with melons, and here's $10,000. We're going to fill it up with melons whether the melons are ripe or not, right? Because it's $10,000 in cash. Okay? Even if somebody else was going to be selling it to that person for $10,000 dollars to fill up that truck. It is whoever sells first gets the money. So there's not a there's no way to actually honor contracts and that becomes real problems. Because of those problems in rural developing countries, the buyers in the supermarkets and merging the supermarket alliance actually wants to buy from stable large quote plantation growers of larger countries like South Africa that will send trucks and distribute produce all the way through Southern Africa for example. The need to honor contracts is a big issue. And the other issue is land tenure. Again, you probably have seminars on who owns land. But if you don't own the land, okay, and the government owns the land, then why do you invest in making the land better? If you don't make the land better, you don't make the soil better, you don't get better yield. And if the government doesn't assign you the land, then if your tribe, okay, or community assigns you the land, then the chief could give or take away the land depending on who they want to allocate the land to. This is a big issue. Okay, new changes in Tanzania, Ethiopia. These are big issues. Who owns the land? Who has the rights to the land? We might hear of stories in the United States of what happens in Zimbabwe or otherwise called Zim, but the truth is in each of the countries, most of the communities don't own the land. They don't have deeds to the land. They have access to the land. If they're lucky, they have access to the land itself. So lack of uh, land, lack of, and then lack of agricultural credits at reasonable rates. It's cheaper sometimes to get a microfinancing loan from friends from communities than it is to go to a bank because banks see agriculture as high risk and thus charge high rates of interest. If you make a business profitable, you can charge 20 to 30 to 40 percent interest, even short-term loans? No. So again, you don't borrow the money, you don't have access to capital, you don't have access to investment. Okay, so enterprise development, despite all these challenges, can be done solely, but often it's done in a multidisciplinary way. It's connected by many actors or agents that are connected by what I what I use the term is champion, somebody that believes in something and does it even if nobody else does. So you have the person who believes in a plant or a crop, as you hear about later with Moringa, or you hear about these from fresh, fresh vegetables. You hear about a business champion, somebody who really is going to take this microenterprise, and this could be a woman, a man in a community, it's not a big company per se, but somebody who actually serves as a leader, and they get other people excited in their community to do it. And then all these other circles are the way in which you as Princeton University the faculty, the students, you're the next generation of people that hopefully will provide information to these communities and growers to help them make the decisions. Okay? So how, how do we accomplish this? We, rather than doing a production paradigm, we use a market-first science-driven approach. There's a lot of text, but I'm going to give you the highlights. A, we change a paradigm from production to marketing, from passive to active entrepreneurial, from single part to holistic system, so that you can't just sell somebody some triple tape which sounds great for drip irrigation, but then they don't have a pump, they don't have a treadle mill, they don't have solar power to get the water out of the ground, unless you'd like to carry everything in a bucket on your head, right? They don't have a water storage container, and they don't have anything to, to use a trip with tape in. So you have to almost give whole kits to make it deep, viable. And I can tell you there's a lot of, there's hundreds of thousands of treadle pumps out there that are just not used anymore because the animals eat the tubing, the women and the children are, are, are the ones who use a treadle pump. Everybody knows what a treadle pump is? Yes? It's something you put in the, it's a pump you put in the water, but you pump the water out to put in an irrigation tank or some boating tank, it has to have power. You use a generator, but how many people can afford generators? Some can, and then the generators are built in China, they break two days later, or the parts are stolen. And then how many repair people exist in those rural areas? Very few. 
So the treadle pumps are nice because you just use it as a bicycle. And it's great for us because, you know, we all watch the news when we bicycle, but, you know, when you're living out there and you're working all day long, running for another two hours on a bicycle is not something desirable, by the way. Okay? So you could do it now with solar panels, which are really cheap and very inexpensive, and you get the water up there. But you have to do it as a kit, otherwise it doesn't work. What we do is we focus on private sectors and communities from the outset. We go to communities and people that want to really make a change, are willing to make a change, sit with them, using a participatory approach, and then we move forward. And then we focus on quality control. Our development activities, you know, here we could think when we're back in the US about the theory that goes behind it, the different hypothesis that we test over here, but when we're out there in the, in the country, we try to do development activities that relate to marketing activities so we have a single push through. Okay. And yes, we could do these models of, of crop production going through the entire value chain and the post-harvest value chain and the addition afterwards. And this is worth doing because our projects in general have generated now over $40 million to the small older farmers in rural Sub-Saharan Africa. $40 million, that's a lot of money, right? That's not money in our pockets, money in the researchers' pockets. It's money, not even our partners' projects in those countries, but it's money in the pockets of those small farmers and families that never had before. So I'll just go through a couple of whirlwinds, if that's okay. Here's Senegal, we use a participatory approach. Sometimes the women control the community, sometimes the men control the community, but whatever it is, the cultural context there, we, it's an honor, it's a privilege, we go there, we, we talk about what we'd like to do, we listen to what they would want from us, and we try to come up with a, a way in which expectations can be met. Okay? I'm very proud now. This horse doesn't look like it's that, in that good a shape, does it? But you can't buy horses and mules and ox with US AID project money, by the way. But we did it, and we called it logistical transportation. Because we asked the community what was their biggest issue. Now, some farmers live on a farm outside a rural area, in a rural area, right? In Senegal, they all live in villages and they have to walk or get some type of transportation to a rural area where they're then allowed to farm. Okay? The women are only allowed to farm little rows of plants because the men are quote the chief farmers there, they grow the maize, they grow the cassava, and they grow the groundnuts. Okay? But they told us that the biggest limitation was transportation. So we, we bargained, we got the animals that they wanted, we bargained with the government to give the carts, and then the women ran taxi services on off-season as well, but they were able to get their, themselves and the family out to the fields in the morning after they made breakfast for the husband and kids, brought them back for lunch after they made lunch for the husbands, and in time to, for them to go back and make supper for the husbands, but otherwise they couldn't reach their fields. Okay, so meeting the challenge of sustainable world development and women's empowerment using plants to us was a real, was very exciting. Okay, women are often marginalized in these rural affairs. They have poor access or no access to land and resources. Each country, of course, is different. I'm just giving you kind of a vignette. They tend to grow peanuts and other low-value crops. It doesn't generate enough income, but they're busy having to generate the income, so they keep themselves busy. Women had little access to market, and so in concert with the government, we got them to agree to let the women grow proboscis. They thought it was crazy because they make all the money in groundnuts, and they did it. But we started to do that, and the model worked. And it empowered the women, it gave them access and managed their own resources, it increased their standard of living. This is, these are just pictures of the community, pictures of the, the lead grower of one of the communities. And what they found is that the hibiscus, when done correctly, it gave them real income. And they had the opportunity to manage that disposable income at the first time of their life. Before the intervention, they grow a row of hibiscus, very low yield, and they put it on the ground. But we know that's not so good because you can get microbiological damage or contamination, I should say, and you get sand. Anybody eat? You have the unsweetened iced tea here, right? You want to make sure the unsweetened iced tea is kind of good, safe, right? And you want to make sure there's no sand to extraneous materials in it. So you can do simple interventions like keeping the viscous off the ground. Can you see in the back or do we need the light support? That's a question, by the way. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Okay. Okay, quality, price, I guess the graph didn't show up, but it was really saying that when you deal with quality, there is a cost in price because it, it takes some more time. But, and quality is a multiple <coughs> character of products. Senegal was always known to, as a hibiscus producer, but it was always known as the worst hibiscus producer, and they always got the cheap prices. There's always a, a role for cheap prices, right? But it doesn't help them improve their livelihood. So in this case, we started to introduce new varieties. Okay, This is how they... Get the hibiscus that sold here is for the tea, by the way. Other plants in Africa eat the leaves as, a, as what we call an African indigenous vegetables. They're very rich in certain polyphenols and nutrients. You have to take out the seed. It's coming from the calyx, unopened calyx. Look how beautiful it is. Though. It takes a lot of hours to perform it. 
So instead, we built something that's really cheap with a rubberized end, so they can pop out the seeds very quick, and it saved them about six hours a day to get the same yield done. Right? That's a lot for women and the children, because they bring the children apples. Very happy with that. And then we introduced just very simple um, products, bleach clean to obtain clean products, keeping it off the ground. Okay, so we went from one grow group to two, th two grow groups up to 4,000 women over 35 grow groups. Many formalized, but that costs money, so some not formalized. And we linked them to the private sector with tracking of the bags. So G1 comes from this grower one and this hut one, where they would store the bag. Okay? We did focus on quality on purpose, and then we also gave them the backup of the chemistry, which I'm not going to focus too much on this lecture, but when you look at the anthocyanins, and the, the, there's two major ones, the viscous, that's what gives it the red color. And then we added value by getting an eco soil that is European associated, organic certified, and organically certified, agreeable, and the USDA called not national organic produ production. If you look at quality, where the women produces, you can look at the, the yields, the standard quality, and the price received from standard quality to high quality. So by doing a little bit, you just doubled your money. The yield might be low, it may not increase, but by doubling the quality, Double your yield. If you add organic production certification, okay, you got a premium price. You go to fair trade, you can get a higher price. But you know, it costs a lot of money for fair trade. It makes you all feel good, by the way. Because the groups in Europe that really are keeping that eight thousand, ten thousand dollars it takes for the community to do a fair trade. So most communities opt not to do a fair trade as long as they can sell the product. Okay, so these groups opted not to do fair trade. They didn't care about the American buyers. They were able to sell everything that they could locally and regionally. So it went from $1 a kilogram down to $2.2 a kilogram. Now that's a major difference, right? Particularly if the profit loss ratio is, is, is about 90 cents, right? It just made it better. It reduced the planting time for improved profits and 30% premium price. So we maximized the agricultural poten potential. They bought into it, they were engaged in it. They made the decision of which types of production systems they wanted, okay? And they were producing it sustainable and organically even though the organically wasn't always certified to be organic because they didn't care about that too because that was another 4,000 they had to pay. Okay, it made you guys feel good, okay, but they took the 4,000 and wanted to put it in their pockets instead of some person flying down from Europe who could then look at their fields, make good money, by the way, in a legitimate manner, but they, they, didn't, they didn't get that. And they used it for local education. So then it became a national crop. We knew it was successful when initially it was 95% women involved, okay, and then they had a few bad years of drought, and the only crop that made it was hibiscus. Low yields in hibiscus, but it still made it. And we still made the family made money and survived in many cases, farming-wise, because of the hibiscus. Now there was a gender shift. Now the men want access to the money, and they want access to the hibiscus. Okay. And I leave it to you all that are ecological sociologists. I'm just a plant person, okay? and I let you figure out how to overcome that issue itself. So those are big issues, okay? but this is the community itself. But by following best management practices, okay, they were able to deal with food security. Okay? This is Adina. They changed their the formulas, by the way. Now it's more of a highly caffeinated regular coffee thing. But initially when they came in, okay, this was a, a, a really nice bottle. Okay? Cute cartoon, right? Africanized. And it had all the science that goes in. So these are some of the products that come in from the hibiscus. Okay? From something that was never exported except to Mexico, but very low price, to something that's now exported and used in different products. Along the same line, the same community is looking for what else they can do. And they're sitting under these shrubs, and the shrubs are actually medicinal plants. And we said, well, we can use some of those medicinal plants. So this is one example of Pinka Libra, it's a type of Combrado Micanthum. It's a bush tea of Senegal. Okay, just like we have our bush tea of an herb here, a mint, perhaps, chamomile, you might call it. Okay, they were able to harvest it. We looked at different populations because we're, there's always different tastes and flavors, right, from different plants. But you in different areas, it could be different species, it could be different populations. And so depending on who's going to drink it as a tea, you may want it more bitter, that's associated with health and medicine, or less bitter, like us Americans, and we don't want something so bitter as a tea to be able to do it. And then as we did it, we looked at other science as applications of it, because we wanted to use science to help drive buyers in the market. We were using it very crassly, if you will, okay? We were cheapening our pure science to be able to find, identify certain scientific discoveries that would generate market interest for them for the growth. And we found, we found it's a potent anti-inflammatory agent, and actually there's a patent on it, it's a very potent glucose lowering agent, just from the leaves of this plant. And in the leaves itself, one fraction of it will have the different condensed catechins 
that you find in green tea, and the other, these novel <coughs> flavoned alkaloids that were never discovered in the plant, whole new ring structure in the plant as well. And so another type of plant where you go to a community and you introduce hibiscus, you introduce a horticulture, and they're sitting under a bush, a weed tree, and it turns out to be grafonia. Now, there's 54 products in the U.S. that are grafonia, okay? Maybe you want to take some after this lecture because it's good against antidepressant activity. It's also good in treating fibromyalgia and insomnia, okay? It's really good for weight loss, obviously, I haven't used enough of it, okay? But the grafonia is really kind of cool. It's a nut from a plant, and it's a source of 5-HTP, which stands for 5-hydroxytryptophan, chemical structure below, and the seeds are used then as an antidepressant. And it's all it's only found in West Africa. It's all shipped to China, semi-purified, shipped back to Europe and the United States, and then they put it in a lot of different formulas, which you can now buy at CVS or many of the stores in downtown Princeton. Right now, because of the quality control, we have hundreds and hundreds of women going in and collecting the seeds from the ground. It's not a lot of work, right? The trees are wild. And it's a $12 million industry now in Ghana alone to export. And how do you train? How do you do these kind of things that are not rocket science, okay? It's not theoretical. You give kind of good, laminated, easy pictures, because most of them don't read and write. That old style, you, know, you might Twitter and Facebook here. And there, you just want to see pictures. That might be the only picture that's hanging in the hook, by the way, okay, because it's graphonia. But it gives good indication of how to do maturity, color, close colors. And by working on grades and standards, and this and another medicinal plant called Volcongo, which we do for outdoors, is actually undergoing ISO regulations now, so it can be custom tailored to what finds in West Africa, so when other groups and countries steal the material and bring it to their country, it'll be harder for them to reach and meet the ISO standards. We do it again to protect the source of origin and the communities and the growers who are doing it. Okay? And we've introduced this into Liberia. Now, if you can do anything in Liberia and it works, you know you can do it anywhere. Any of you been to Liberia? I won't talk about Liberia stores, but we have big programs in Liberia. We had it before Ebola, we have it now during Ebola and after Ebola. But look, the one picture I really like is uh, this is a man in a blue shirt, right? He looks like a peasant, right? He's really a PhD in forestry, the only PhD in forestry in the world in Liberia. But I had to set up the picture to make him look spontaneous. So go with me, okay, on this one, okay? The person selling it on the right, okay, Larry Acquise, is a, is a collector of the phone. That bag will feed a family of six for a month. How long do you think it takes to pick up those seeds from the ground? Not a lot of time, right? Harvesting window is four months. Cash, sustainable. When you talk about food security and cash income, and disposable issue. And wild plants are native in it. By knowing the native plants and knowing what they use for, and it's not used in local culture, it's only used internationally, you create different opportunities. Now, this is significant. Significant because $5,000, $10,000, $1,000 actually only of cash income to families more than they're making. And in these areas in Neva County and Bonn County and Lofa County in Liberia, there's no cash. I mean, it's, if you go to these areas, there's no cash out there because there's no jobs, no work. And here you're bringing them into a, a, a society in a way that preserves the environment, gives them the disposable income that they need and allows them to move forward. And we do the same thing with Grains of Paradise. Anybody like Boston Ale or Sam Adams or Summer Pale Ale? You guys must be good drinkers. I know it's Princeton. You must be wine here. That's yeah, so right, because we're more the working class. We do the beer. Okay. Well, that's flavored by this aromatic spice from West Africa called Grains of Paradise. It's Ephraimola novogata. It's a really interesting plant. It has compounds in it, including the ginger oils from the ginger and the pipe green that you get from the black pepper that have the kind of the pizzazz and taste in the bouquet. I'm kind of obsessed with food. And this is what the plant looks like. It's a member of the ginger ACA family where you have ginger you have tumor, but those, when you get the product of commerce from the rhizomes, okay, the underground root structures, here you get it really from the seeds. It's really unique in that. It's an understory shrub, if you grow, understory of cocoa, or okay, cacao. These are black pepper, by the way. If you've never seen a black pepper vine out there, there's a lot of different types of black pepper, a lot of different species. And we did the same thing with indigenous plants in post apartheid South Africa, where we focus on rooibos tea and honey bush tea, which you see here. Again, engaging the communities helping them write grants so that they own their own tea courts, going to colored communities, because in that area of the Western Cape, there's no quote, black communities. It's colored communities historically. And they never had access to, to land. And during the part of it, of course, they were kicked off the land and then were given back the not such desirable land afterwards. And they didn't know what to do with it. So they would go up into the mountains, collect a few trees, while there was some large African plantation owners where you get most of your rivals from. Now, 
by operating the T-quartz, because this is a plant that doesn't need only to be dried, you actually have to drive over it. Okay, you have to actually ferment it. Now, if you drive over it with gas and oil will leak on the plants that you don't talk about, it's not so desirable, but when you get it together so that it's sustainable and you can crush the leaves by driving over it without the oil and the gas standing over it, and you dry it, it heats it up, and as it heats up, it's when those fermentation occurs, just like vanilla, right? When you harvest the vanilla bean, we all know about when it's on the plant that doesn't have a taste, it's when it goes through a fermentation process that the bouquet of aromas come into play. And the same thing with the funny bush and rabbits. It needs to be fermented, and if it's not done correctly, we don't have a good quality. These things we, uh, we worked on for a long time, and we wanted to show the Africans that they could actually harvest, grow, trademark, and sell. And this is all packaged in, in southern sub Saharan Africa. Honey bush and rabbits, it used to be sold at the on the corner of whole, whole Earth, yeah. whole Earth okay. for a number of years, and, and it sold pretty well. But again, it was just an experiment to see if it was <coughs> These are now being sold in Sub-Saharan Africa. A whole range of different spices okay, that you can find from rural communities that never had money before. Okay. Now, if you look at the bottom right, I love this picture of yellow, because it kind of looks like mustard, but it's chili. Have you ever bought chili like that before? <coughs> Have you ever seen that before? Look how cool it is. And you can look at it by scoble units, by the thermometer tells you it's too hot or not, or by the capsinoids, or the alkaloids. But it's, you could custom design it so it has the right bouquet or aroma, <coughs> hot or not too hot, and you can sell it in different colors. These are all community grown. And by packaging and selling it, they all made a lot of money. These things are shipped to Japan now. You know, I mean, whole earth, I'm not commenting on what they have or not have. <coughs> But anything that could get into the Japanese market, you know, has gone through some <coughs> studies for cleanliness. But look at the products. Again, quality makes a big difference. So we took those models and we began to apply it to vegetables. Okay, we said, look at the herb, spice, and medicinal plants are great, but like people need to eat, they want to eat fruits, fruit, fruit, vegetables. And we did the same thing with fresh vegetables. With, and we began in Zambia, right near Livingston Falls, which is not a bad place to work, but a place where they didn't think they could grow horticulture. And again, it was the same issue. People didn't eat fresh vegetables. They couldn't grow fresh vegetables because environmental variation, low availability access. They couldn't afford it. There was a lack of knowledge about the composition, why bother? And there was focus on survival, often limited knowledge. So we did this through using controlled um, production practices, both down in southern Zambia and up in, up in the Lusaka area where this photograph takes place. These are retired women, well-educated, retired civil servants, and they wanted to make because once he retired, there was no real um, pension plan, by the way, in many developing countries. And so they wanted to make sure they could still take care of themselves, and they did it themselves. We have now over 100 women working on different greenhouses, growing a wide range of vegetables for the supermarkets, and they're making a lot of money. This is a, a picture of, 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 music, of the communities growing vegetables where they never grew commercial horticulture crops before. Can you imagine that? You can could, you could compare this picture to anybody doing it right. And it's from one area in Livingston alone, these girls have earned over five million dollars in only four years for writing their fresh vegetables. That's a lot. That's a significant change to an economy. No prior horticultural experience. Okay, look at these pictures. I would say that look better than some of the places I go visit in, in southern Jersey. Although I've said that the directors say that. Okay, and the specialty in the Livingston again. We started the work by um, working with heads of the household that were, were blind, by the way, disabled. They were, they were serving as beggars in Livingston. The government didn't want beggars to be in Livingston because it made you all feel uncomfortable when you wanted to go down there to see the Victoria Falls and go bungee jumping and spending $400 a day at the Livingston Hotel, which by the way is a beautiful hotel. <coughs> so we got the hotels to buy products from our communities before we even started. So they built these shacks for these heads of households and they brought the families out there. They told them, we're going to buy you, build you a house. Well, this is great. Only time the government's ever done anything for me. They did it, they moved them 10 kilometers outside of Livingston, and they left them there. No, 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 no jobs, there's nobody living there, not a lot to do. Now they're growing vegetables, you can see these vegetables, and then, then we combine them together to aggregate it, and they sell it back now to David Livingston and Sun International. They have to buy from the communities to deal with the we can start the project. The challenge is in all this is always the yield gap. You can get people started horticulture, any commodity, and the question is how do you truly make it profitable? And the issue is you know, how do you improve the biophysical limitations, how do you make sure that there's good fertility, water, variety, the right thing, and all this needs to get done with the communities. And that's an ongoing challenge by the way. 
But you look at a field like this that's grown, by the way, by the, blind, the head of the household blind community. The spouse, the children are not blind. The head of the household is. Okay, yet the head of the household is out there weeding, out there harvesting. It's phenomenal, right? And they've never done it before. So I was there before they got started. I was there when they bought their first cell phones. I was there when they finally had money to send their kids to school. So we do these programs now more as a social economic justice program than we just do as kind of basic research, because it's not basic research. It's, it's trying, looking at things to look at behavioral change communications. And look at these fields, weed free. They didn't take the weeds out for our picture. Although if it was really a weed field, they wouldn't show you a picture. But it was a lot of weed fields, so I'm not showing it. Okay? And they have to do crop scheduling and selling. And then we work on germplasm, improving germplasm. The one on the bottom, the middle right, I mentioned this because Adam only told you I was a, a plant breeder. So that's my basil, it's called Poppy Joe's basil. It was the first fusarium resistant basil. Okay, fusarium is a soil borne disease, there's no control from it. So we wanted to always improve plants with age and resistance. And so what we do, we that or flavor. Okay, but this is a woman who, who was the lead honey bush grower. Okay, she's a fantastic woman. Okay, her community itself has generated over half a million dollars for those growers over time. That's that's significant. They had no income before. They were just growing a couple plants, right? That's transformational. Okay, now none of the things in horticulture, the examples I say, changes the world. But you don't change the world, you have to change the mindset of the cultural inertia where nothing can happen. Okay, and you change the paradigm, and you change the concept that there can be innovation, there can be change, to, in my view, restore hope and, and set of dignity, to give them the skills that, in the end, they don't care if they grow horticulture crops or they do something else. Once they understand the system, they can choose to do a variety of different things, and they feel that they do it themselves, and they do it well. So she won the Female Farmers Award in South Africa, and that's no easy task for all of South Africa, by the way, okay? In 2005, we're And now we're applying the same models to African indigenous plants. You all recognize any of these plants? Okay. A weed is a weed in some areas, and, and it's an edible plant to others. We interviewed over 1,500 people in New Jersey, Florida, and Massachusetts, in Chinese, in Spanish, and in two, in two languages from India, asking what were the ten top herbs and spices and greens. And several of them, those groups, listed amaranth and other weed species. What was a crop to them is a weed here in the United States. Spider plants is medicinal plant, most of you don't know. I would just go through these, but the issue is when you look at them nutritionally, which very little information is out, they can rival kale or quote those super nutrient dense foods. Because really what you're looking for is access, affordability, and high nutrient content to use for that food stuff. Okay, and it doesn't have to be better. Okay, you can see in the spinach is higher in, in pro in what we call vitamin A, but it's not really vitamin A, it's, it's, it's a pro vitamin A, the carotenoids, and as measured by beta carotene. We have a whole lab, we do all this stuff in. Okay, and these are just some quick pictures. My favorite though, because I still have a few minutes before we go to questions. I see you, you're very gentle. Hey, okay, yeah. let's see what that one. So, Moringa we're very obsessed with. We're obsessed, well, I've got a lot of obsessions as you can see through the talk. But this is a plant that actually is a high accumulator of many of the minerals and vitamins that have been identified to be limited in malnourished populations. Okay, so rather than buying a multivitamin, and having FAO having to drop them in the air and deliver them to refugee camps, you could have this plant, which grows in really denuded poor soils, be grown by communities. In, in the United States and in India, we, if you eat at an Indian restaurant, you order drumstick. It's the immature part of the moringa. But the leaves are super, super high in nutrition, in vitamin E, the high in, really high in total protein, the high in vitamin E, the high in carotenoids. You can see the super low in ascorbic acid, but the ascorbic acid does not stay when something's dry. You don't expect it to be there. And, but, Surprisingly, it's super high in all these polyphenols. Some plants are grown in the United States and still to the dietary supplement market simply as a source of cursus and camphor. These are kind of ubiquitous polyphenols. But we know the health benefit of dietary input of higher than normal polyphenols. And this is over many years looking at a couple different countries. What the Matanga Women's did, because it has the reputation of being good against immune diseases and there's a very high prevalence of AIDS, in Zambia as it is in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, is they developed this product. And in the first year, they made $40,000 profit from it. Now that's not bad if you talk about food security. You grow the plant, it's a perennial plant, you don't have to regrow it, right? You can, hog, you can grow your vegetables, something between the rows of the market trees, but you keep them as shrubs, not trees. 
And these are just some ringer and nays. I showed this to in this class, and I tried to warn you that it wasn't going to be a, uh, a, a major economic assessment of it. The relative to the ringer out there now, <coughs> people are finding these numbers to be accurate, and the maze, of course, changes depending on it. But again, if you compare any high value to low value, it will be dramatic, and that's just simply the point. Uh, okay, if we look at what happens to crops, you know, it doesn't need a lot of technology to keep them in the shade. Have you ever seen, you, you've traveled around the world, right? But some people have traveled to outside Princeton, outside of Princeton County, anyway. You see often vegetables on the, on the, on the ground and the, and the person with the umbrella over the head, right? Clearly, they like the shade. Well, what's happening to those highly respiring climacteric containing vegetables, right? It's, it's aging prematurely, so just simply putting shade a little can give you some extra shelf life. Using other types of evaporative coolers, zero energy coolers, you know, using, using the cooling effect of drying out energy, using water that's drying out over mulch, over sand, over coal, and it works very effectively. It's done in China, it's done in Southeast Asia, and it's now being introduced as the lower rate in Sub-Saharan sub Africa. <coughs> this is one of my favorite pictures, because you look at clean water, it's always a big issue. But you look at the water on the street vendor down there, but you don't see that water, right? Because you're just buying it. You're going to look at your vegetables. Well, if you really plated that out, um, anybody here is a microbiologist? Okay, anyway, I'm not, but I still plate this stuff out. There's a lot of really funky things growing in that water at that point, right? It may give it taste, it may give it other energy, I don't know, but in the end, there's other ways to lose weight in that. And so I think you want to go for the clean water instead. But some of our models led to products that ended up in food and wine we're very proud of. And others that can be done using science led to a series of books, primers on hibiscus. These are the product spec sheets that we do. And we're very proud of the WHO guidelines we did on good ag practices from which I showed you these examples earlier because it's now in use in different countries. So high value horticulture makes the most compelling case for the development of rural and peri-urban enterprise micro enterprises. It provides for food security provides income generation for you to develop, and a set of skills and normative business sense that otherwise they might not have had the opportunity to develop. One hopes, but can't link to improve nutrition, because you don't know how you're going to use the extra income, and you don't know if they're consuming some of the vegetables and produce that they're growing, although we are doing surveys, as I'll show you in a minute. Anyway, these models are replicable, which we're doing as well. And here, when we talk about sustainability, it's used ad nausea, so to speak, but we prefer the term sustainability to both economic and environmental being the collective group. Now, how do we link horticulture? You have patience for two more minutes? Yeah. Because you'd be too rude to say no, so I'll go anyway. <laughs> okay, if we link horticulture to nutrition, we work with Empath, which is a US-based medical school consortium led by IUPUI in Indianapolis, for the Purdue IU Medical School, with Harvard and Tufts and a lot of other groups, where they are, have a hospital in Western Kenya, the largest uh, food, um, feeding program in, in the world, and they've been looking at retrovirals and they realized that their patients were not surviving that well because they were only eating the common food in Kenya, which is maize-based only. So they had clinic sites, we grew a lot of these AIVs next to these sites, okay? And what we find is if we add to the maize and beans, sometimes they had beans, they started to eat the nightshades, the amaranth, the spider plant, mm -hmm. the cow peas, the protelaria, pumpkin leaves, kale and cabbage, and they reported that they felt better, they made money, they were consuming it. Now that doesn't really tell you too much about it, but it starts to create a bridge between health and nutrition. And again, we re-looked at those, those nutritional attributes of the amaranth, the nightshade, and the spider plants, which were very high in both iron, and the availability of iron and, and pro vitamin A. We did a lot of work with these nightshades, these are edible nightshades. We tend to think in botany here in the United States they were all poisonous nightshades, like the Atropo belladonna, but these are Edible selenum species that come from the potato, potato, eggplant family, okay? We did a lot of taste tests, okay? We go to the value chain, but really what I'm trying to do for the light, um, trying to get to this next section, we're using that information on the African indigenous vegetables that look good, where we got, looked at the popularity of these using the market first. And the goal of this program is to improve the production and increase consumption of AIVs in communities, and then have a direct link to the dietary, their diets relative to, to the health. Okay. This is done in Zambia and Kenya in concert with the World Vegetable Center in San okay. So these are looking at plants that are considered to be nutrient dense. Okay. Why any one of these issues above, vitamin A, thiamine, riboflavin, vitamin C, calcium, iron, and zinc, focus those on 
factors that look at nutritional success in communities, okay? And then together look at the nutrition links. We have a direct link between strategic interventions that introduce AIDs and African Indian vegetables to communities that never consumed them before and others that had consumed them before and tracked their diets over five years. So the key of this project is looking at access, affordability, availability, and adoption. That is increased consumption using this market first and consumer first approach. And that seems to be working out well now. And in doing that, we're in these different countries, we're surveying 400 households, okay, 200 are based for the intervention, and 200 control. So as I wrap up, I would like to say when it comes to food, hunger, and health, there's no one answer for agriculture. There's no one answer for food security. There's no one answer. But there are different complex components where we feel that horticulture can play a significant role. You have to deal with the politics, the commitment, the public policy. You have to deal with the corruption. You have to deal with the, the issues that are really out there. There is a global push and continues to be for carbs and energy because it's easy to model. It's easy to model 100 million people eating the same food source and then adding a, a new type of carotenoid in it to make it a, a more nutritious food source with some carotenoid. It may not require an iron or anything else, but it's easy to model. And the industry is based on that, so it makes sense. You do that through orange plus sweet potatoes now, or orange maize, in order to achieve, quote, these global dietary goals of reducing poverty and improving health. The issue is environmental protection, climate change can be at a crossroads. Land tenure and ownership issues at crossroads. Population control, post harvest loss. And again, why the lack of focus on fruits and vegetables. So I'd like to end by saying there's a relevance of innovation in all this. Innovation to me can be spontaneous, yet requires a purposeful and strategic approach for commercialization. It's not always embedded in a culture or history of a country. So when you're working in developing worlds where they don't have entrepreneurs, and don't have really in the rural area very many successful, particularly agricultural entrepreneurs, it's very difficult to make change because they're used to the way things are. And maybe they're used to the way things are because people have tried things that have only run into failure or walls before. But some individuals do seem predisposed to be entrepreneurs and innovators discoverers, while others see research without seeing its application. And those are the champions that Detroit can work with. Those are the champions that can help diffuse that technology, diffuse those ideas around. So innovation, other by itself, doesn't necessarily lead to increased productivity and competitiveness, but it is a major component in it. It requires in the human capital and capacity building and appreciation of the investment in the workforce, those across all skills of education skills and abilities, and that will provide a stronger foundation for the private sector. And if someone successfully brought together this concept of innovation through the lead growers that you saw, through the communities that you saw earlier, there's really a driving force that leads to increased profitability and market competitiveness, and that then improves the food security and economic independence. Horticulture, in the end, has been neglected and an undervalued component to income generation, nutritional improvement, and the food debate, and I hope this will help spur it on great example then. There's a ton of people to acknowledge, and so I'll just do that. Let me just say, oh, sorry, I was supposed to introduce Jim, but Adam kind of did for me since I had a class obligation. We're past five minutes past time, so if anybody needs to leave, uh, get another obligation, uh, feel free to do so, but otherwise, we have some time for some questions. I'm trying to formulate in my mind a sustainability question which you've addressed in various ways here. I understand that the science and technology part, but what I don't understand is what you find in the kind of socio-cultural characters that emphasize a number of things as the changes required in that area. I'm wondering how sustainable those are. It's a really good question. And I would say that in our projects, to a large extent, about 75% of the time they have been, to date, sustainable. 25% they haven't been. And I spoke about why in some communities they haven't been first, and I'll talk about why they are. Sometimes there's a lot of jealousy. You have a lead grower or lead communities that are making money, okay? Everybody else, there's kind of the concept of an African family. If you do good and you earn money, you kind of owe us some of that money or some of the products that come out of it. Rather than we kind of have this other way of looking at the modeling in our country, you know, a more capitalistic, a more kind of self-reliant, independent, a rugged independent aspect. In Africa, there's really, because there was never a social network of coming from the federal government, or coming from the national government, came from the tribes. 
there was a concept that if somebody was doing good in the community for a relative and everybody was related to each other, that you diffuse that. And that's been an issue. It's been an issue for theft. It's been an issue for jealousy. It's been, been an issue for, for di dealing with different rumors. So how do you maintain that social economic benefit? What we try to do is do really good communication for making sure that the community leaders and all the people registered or are, all the people that committed to and participate in this exercise, if you will, are registered and agreed to the following commitments. One of those commitments is a 30% of all the products that are sold go back into the community okay, for the agricultural development. The other, they, they, some communities want as much money as they can right away, others want it over time, so they have to open up banks, and there has to be two or three people signing a, a, you know, access to it and out of the money. So it becomes a real dilemma as to who truly controls the money. The more success you have, sometimes the more challenging it is. It's not unlike when you work with a cooperative right, or association. It's if the, if the managers and the leaders of that association are really good, then, it's, then, it, then it can work out. Often, when, when you go into a community, you, you, you start working with the leaders of that community. And those leaders of the community always have preferential treatment, and always have access to these new things, rather than getting filtered down. So it's not always on equitable to deal with basis. But we try to do it through rotation of offices, through election of offices, and through all the information being public, and through these, what we call these outdoor, in, in Liberia, we use the term an outdoor um, an outdoor follow-up, like an outdoor meeting, where all the information is discussed in front of everybody. The more we put that information out, or they put the information out, the more they need it themselves, the, the less problems we have. So if we rely on one or two communicators of that community, they may really be keeping a lot of things to themselves. So does that answer your question? Am I yeah, let me ask. Uh, it does. Thank you very much. Bart, let me ask. You bring in, you and your colleagues bring an enormous amount of human capital to all this and, and so on, and eventually you leave. Uh, and so what do you find seven years after you've left and you're no longer there or that hasn't happened yet? No, no, it's happened and I'm smiling because sometimes you, 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 it may go back to what it was before, yeah. of course, there's, there's that. But we've, we find in a couple of different areas, <clears throat> when money is run out and we're no longer there and we do it correctly, the community continues to do it on their own. We had one project funded by Oxfam International in southern Zambia. And Oxfam, since I'm, I'm being taped, so Oxfam was very gracious in giving us the money. Sometimes the money would come in very late. Okay? Sometimes it wouldn't come in at all. So we warned the farmers that we were setting this up, and it was a short-term project. If additional funds came from Oxfam, we would provide additional. What we try to do, and I didn't, maybe I didn't emphasize it clear enough, is we try to, everybody in, in the team in those countries are nationals of that country. Okay, so in Zambia, there's 24 or 40 people from Zambia. Not us flying in from Princeton or Rutgers together, but the Zambians. Each of the organization implementing partners are from that country. So we spend a lot of time building and training there, that capacity. We work to the extent we can, sometimes more successfully, sometimes less with the universities. That is the other movers and shakers, which the ones that could be and shape is if properly motivated in the, in the right context. But in the Oxfam production, where we were focusing on Chile, and we made each family control the three rows, it was a long rows, of their own production. So it wasn't, um, I'm interceding myself. Depending on the actual production system, you get a lot of problems with who manages what, who makes money. So what we decided to do is make everybody accountable for their production input. So we do, we share resources, we get them to share everything. But in the end, there is one, two, three, four, five, six desks here. So family one has this row, maybe a double row, triple row. Family two has that row. So guess what? If, they, if family two is too busy doing something else, and they don't go out and plant. When they do go out and plant, the plant's going to be really small. These people planted on time, really good growers, and all of a sudden you have social embarrassment. Mm -hmm. You use the social and the normative controls amongst the communities to help encourage at least public acceptable behavior and better growing practices. And at the end of the season, at the beginning, they don't understand it. At the end of the season, when this family is getting $200 for their peppers, the chili peppers, and this family got 10, and they're both sweating, that's the same amount of time, then all of a sudden we see increased behavior and change behavior pattern from this. 
And that community, once we started to assign individual rows, where everybody knew that it's cycle. This is your row, this is your row, okay? <coughs> then we found that if there's no funding, we come back later, the program's are actually strong. Now one group came in and they drove past the community and they said, we don't think your project is a success. We know you have 150 people involved, we know you made X thousand of dollars, but we don't see different tin roofs. There's a drive-through type of criteria people have. Tin roofs, apparently, are what Europeans like to see is, oh, people made money and they improved their roof, okay? We think that's kind of a colonial attitude, myself, and I say that in front of the camera on purpose. Why? Because if you truly believe in a participatory approach, you ask the community, what do they want to do with their money? And this community, which is located next to the Botswana and Namibia border, there's a lot of truckers that come through that area, and there's not a lot of jobs. And so the women, the young daughters, were going out and getting involved in prostitution in order to make money. They rather make sure that their money goes to their daughters to get them out of that type of work and not put a roof on the house, but make sure that the kids had jobs. So now the family got two or three rows. So we had a big debate with some of our funders saying, look, if somebody wants a silver roof, they can put a tin roof, they can put it on. If they want to be able to use the money for the school fees, and some of these have six, eight, ten kids, that's a lot of school fees. They add up, right, of which the kids otherwise wouldn't be in school. Or to give the, the daughters opportunities not to get involved in what would be less desirable and really sad behavior, but they felt that they had no choices. So it's really crazy how certain things get coming back. No tin roof, but yet the community is expanding, which is doubled in size. All the buyers are coming in because it has a good quality. We want it to be kind of an epicenter of this African bird's eye chili pepper, by the way. And the community is really good, and they haven't received any money for a couple of years. So that would be a good story. Another bad story is with another community that did really good. We had an electrified fence around the community and a wild bull. A wild bull, a male bull, you know, there's, there's a lot of elephants that call bulls. It went a little nuts. It went through a couple huts, it killed a few people, and it destroyed the fences. And it ran through the old vegetable crops. So they lost the money. How do you repair that? Another time is men sometimes got jealous because it was a women's community we were doing. And at night they cut the fence and let the cattle into graze on vegetables. The men are now arrested. And what we do is rather than going to the regular police, we go to the we use the chief and the, and the tribal council to take care of those kind of issues with labor and unacceptable type of behavior. But I go back and say to you that our country, we've been lucky because we've had a really strong extension service for what, like a lot of years now, okay? And I would guess, and I would suggest to you that getting development money in a serious way to a community to get them to be involved in agriculture is not a six month, a nine month, a two or three year type of commitment. It's an ongoing commitment. Our agriculture production will, will, will fall rapidly if we don't support our own extension service. So why are we just kind of shocked when we come to a development program and say, hey, what's going to happen in two years when we're no longer there? It's a legitimate question. And it's more legitimate because those that are involved in extension and outreach often in these developing countries, some of them are very well intended. Most of them lack skills that deal with commercial. You know? Most of them lack the ability to go out and do anything. And most of it's just in the social employment agency. I know I'm saying something politically incorrect. But they don't have the skill set that really helps empower. And that's a whole different change. So really, if you're looking for good investment in money, it's in when you bring in science and when you try to bring in the local money. But it would be unfair, in my view, to feel that what happens after two, three years of the project, it's kind of a USAID perspective. It's like, OK, what do you do for me this week? It's like it's a plant, it's an agriculture, it's not, it's, it's good for the check off the boxes, but if you really want something sustainable, you have to give it long enough time so that there's a diffusion in the natural spontaneity. And by moving it with the private and public sector together, the private sector really acts as that catalyst for the catalyst of change. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. It's a good, it's a good one. I have a question you mentioned at the beginning that land standard is a big problem. Yes. So how do you deal with that? Sometimes. How do you tell the people, because I've often experienced communities that say in Madagascar, they're not sure that they will have the same piece of land in five years when the president changes or something. So how do you... Sometimes we don't deal with it, frankly. Okay, sorry, I'm giving you an answer you don't want to hear. No. But sometimes you really don't. You can't deal with it. You know, when we look at aid work, where you come from Germany, England, Japan, Russia, or the U.S., you kind of carve out a developed country. And your activities get in this province, somebody else's activities get in that province, and you try to work with the communities that really want to work with you, okay? 
But I can say that in one project we had in Rwanda, which I didn't talk about, this was after the genocide we went in there, we were asked to go into the community, from the government, and we worked with two groups of widows and orphans, 100, 100 women and 100 children of each community. And after they were able to show the government that they did something with land, the government for the first time gave title and deeds to the women. Now that's a success, and that answers your question, so you're happy. But in general, not because of the genocide, not be but because of the deed, it was amazing. It was the first time they actually controlled land. Because even when they were married, they didn't have title of the deeds. It was the men's. In this case, the men, you know, it was a horrible experience. And, we, and what they were doing up there is they were growing organic essential oil and geranium. We got them to regrow and rebuild some of their essential oil industries, which the, the Dutch and the Belgian originally brought into um, that part of the world, because it's native to a lot of these aromatic plants. So that's one area. The other is having long-term agreements with the chiefs, with the communities, that we're only going to do this if this is a true community, it's recognized by them, and they have X amount of time on it as long as they use it properly. They don't have to make money, but they have to actually be active in it. And usually that works out too. In the one country of Tanzania, it gets a little bit more complicated, because sometimes the local government disagrees with the national government, and then they're trying to get some American company to come in and farm, and nobody owns the land, and that's like it's beyond my paper. I don't know how to do that. That's real, those are real issues though. But the fundamental underlying issue is why should a group or community invest in the soil, invest in the land unless they know they're going to have access to it long, long term, relative to fertilizer input, relative to growing green manure crops, relative to growing trees, relative to growing plants that can st slow and stop erosion you know, from the heavy rains that come there. There's really less incentive, otherwise you're just kind of mining the land. Okay, so it's a real issue, it's an ongoing issue. Yeah, just have to talk about it. Well, you mentioned about the tin roofs and the people having the ability to choose what they should spend their money on. I was wondering how that relates to nutrition. So I was working with Feed the Future for a few years in Central America before I came here, and I think that's the weakest link. I saw the communities that were growing new crops and making more money weren't necessarily improving their nutrition. Oftentimes they were increasing their soda consumption, their ramen noodles, and sometimes I was getting worse. Yeah, I, you, you, I try to highlight that in the, in the presentation, by the way, that we don't control the disposal, how they spend their money. What you, you need to do in that, and that's a big issue that everybody has found, the latest science research, the sociologists are finding that the, the income is not spent. If you actually track what people are buying at a formal supermarket, you look at the real food versus the packaged goods, that is the non-edibles, where the food is going. But it's really through education and through ongoing, and maybe not just education of that individual family, but education through the schools, through the community schools, through the gardens. And so in Zambia, we're trying to work with Mawa, the Catholic Relief Service, like that, because it just nobody eats fruits and vegetables. And so if we get the kids and the schools to get then they're going to want to have it at home. And if we can prepare or show them different recipes and make the food available, we can but there isn't a direct way to increase the income. And I was trying to, and that's why I tried to spend a few extra minutes letting you know where we're going and trying to make that direct link. Okay, and working with surveying the people and then introducing fresh vegetables, in this case African indigenous vegetables, are going out and seeing whether they're going to be increasing that consumption. If you look at the new USAID Dietary Diversity Scoreboard, it's, it's only like eight, it's a very limited number of characters. You don't really know what people are eating. You don't know how much they're eating because otherwise it's, it's too difficult, too tangential, too difficult to actually enforce. So our surveys match what USAID wants to do for Feed the Future, but it goes to the older FAO, which lists each of the different foodstuffs that they're doing. Okay, so we've already done pilots in, in uh, 75 in Zambia and 75 in, in Kenya now. But the goal is to do 400 over the course of five years to see if we can make that direct link. But right now, there isn't one. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, it's following up on that somewhat. Isn't there a tension between export consuming something yourself, even if it's exported to your own community, if it becomes valuable. So you can see, I can imagine farmers who, who won't consume something because they have cash value, and you have to have the cash, and so they don't want to their diets. That's right. That's right. And that's it. But the, the issue, with, I think, is, is here, if you truly believe in a participatory approach, and you truly believe in trying to educate, then you do that. But ultimately, the communities, the families, in the end, make their own decisions as to it's sometimes really hard to change a diet. You're not going to change someone from that's eating corn all day long, three meals a day, who doesn't think that they've eaten if they have a steak dinner because they don't like, you know, the maize porridge. 
in a certain way. But what you can do is, at least in the Marina and the AIVs, we now are trying to fortify it in with a making instant breakfast here as an inexpensive seeds. They still have the diet that they used to, but we're now making it nutrition. None of the work we're doing actually takes a lot of land away from their commodities. It just gives a little uh, land dedication to the other high value crops. And wasn't there a program to try to add micronutrients to the stable crops? No, most of, the, most of it is trying to add micronutrients as a, another form of vitamins, additional to the foods itself, not to stable crops. There, there are significant, with significant exemptions. The rice that's being bred to be higher in, vi in a vitamin is a is the orange flesh sweet potato that was developed to be orange flesh and that's much richer in the, the carotenoids, that's vitamin A. The golden maize, these are big issues and they're running into serious resistance because the older generation wants the color, the taste, the flavor, what they used to. The younger generation seems to really like the orange flesh sweet potatoes, and at least in the couple countries I'm used to. And so maybe it'll just take a longer amount of time to do it. But that single bullet that makes sense is, is often not the single bullet that you're looking for because maybe they'll have adequate you know, vitamin A, but for vitamin A, but they still will be lacking in iron, they still will be lacking in zinc, they'll still be lacking in a lot of the other minerals that have been identified. Okay? And if they're lacking in the soil, by the way, completely, it's not going to be easy for most plants to accumulate that anyway. So sometimes in some areas, you might have to do it through supplementation of the diet. But the key issue is to go back to what you're saying. If you want it to be economical and sustainable, it has to be pragmatic. The bar has to be low enough and has to be achievable. So you take a plant like Moringa that I showed you. It's a natural rich accumulator. And virtually all those minerals and vitamins that are found to be lacking in malnourished or undernourished populations. So imagine, and we did comparative studies, you know, four teaspoons of it, you know, we give you a simulated U.S. daily recommended allowance. Now, I know a simulated U.S. daily recommended allowance doesn't quite mean too much, but it does show you, you know, unlike parsley, where you have to eat a whole bucket of it, you know, to get enough of the vitamins, you, have, you can eat a little bit, and you still get the requisite minerals and vitamins that you would need on a regular basis. And it'd be cheap, it's easy, and it's good to be grown by individuals. And by the way, this moringa is native and now grown all the way from Pakistan all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula. So it has a very wide geographical range. It has a very large cultural acceptance. You know, those are the other things. You can't just introduce foods that we want because we have some Nebraska senator that wants to sell our, you know, our dairy cows into the Columbia area or I'm sorry to be sarcastic. But I mean, this kind of stuff happens, right? So it has to be, the food has to be culturally acceptable, palatable, and within their, 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 their own food choice. And it's not easy. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Charles. Yeah, this is uh, there's, there's a, a three-minute video if you want to see. Since I I've never done this before, so let's see if it works. Oops, I guess it doesn't work. Thank you. 